All right. So uh, I, I will start and give myself fif 50 minutes from now, uh, which should leave 10 minutes for questions, assuming we're going to stay 17 minutes behind schedule or whatever it currently is. Uh, so I was pretty excited to submit to this conference, uh, in part because of the theme of the conference, but also because I visited Norway for the first time last year. Uh, the uh, Unix user group here in Oslo and the one in Bergen invited me to come last May uh, to speak to both of them. And I really enjoyed it here. And I am out of brown cheese, so I had to come back for that. I can get it in the US, but it's very expensive there. So I, I have bought two kilos already. I'm trying to decide if I'm taking back five kilos or four kilos. I haven't decided yet. Um, may depend on what they let me carry on to the plane. Um, and I, I think I may be the only person in the US who likes brown cheese, so as it turns out. I uh, but uh, I had it here the first time back in May, and you know, I just brought my, as much back as I could. But the reason related to my actual work that I'm glad to be here is because this conference is one of the few in the world, actually, that has this theme of trying to look at the intersection of technology and free society and free culture. And while I work in this small corner of the world uh, of that, uh, so I'm in that little graph on the logo for this conference. I'm way off like in the corner of the technology area, not necessarily in the overlap area. But I got involved because of that intersection. I care about what happens to us as a free society. And I specialize somewhat in this concern of what the licensing of specific types of works, namely works that are governed by copyright, should have with regard to their licensing and how that licensing should be free. And part of what I want to talk about is how that relates to creating a free society uh, as a first principle. I focused mostly on software. Uh, I think that the same issues tend to apply to cultural works as well as software. Uh, there's a lot more intersection than there used to be of those things that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But the question is a reasonable one. Why in the world would we be so concerned about licensing of copyrighted works as part of a question of whether or not we have a free society? Does it actually matter for the future of a free society? I think that it does. I think that what copyright ended up doing by default most of the time in withholding rights from people to do certain types of activities of copying and sharing, I think that's a, a form of oppression. It's admittedly a mild form of oppression compared to the types of oppression we have in the world today, but it's really an intersectional issue. I think that if we're going to remove the structural inequalities that we have in the society, when we look at things like intersectionality, I think software freedom fits in with that, with other types of power dynamics that occur in the world that keep people from living in a free society. I don't believe that software freedom is necessarily at the very top of that list, but I think it's in the list of things that are causing inequities in the world, especially as we become a more technologically focused society and where software governs more and more of our activities in our daily life. What we have with copyright has actually been hundreds of years in the making. The first intellectual revolution, the Enlightenment in Europe, was in many ways spawned because of the printing press. Because we got to a point in our society when you could easily produce books on paper and provide them to people that weren't necessarily monks in a monastery or academics in a university. Individual people could get printed books in their native language of all sorts, uh, and learn the history of science that had begun to, uh, begun to have major discoveries. And the discoveries that we had during the Enlightenment were fed by the fact that there were more people with access to the wealth of human knowledge in books. That was a huge revolution. Now, an interesting side effect of the revolution of the printing press was the introduction of copyright. The introduction of the idea of, well, maybe we should give people some sort of monopolistic control over works. And it was this ostensible trade-off between 
the rights and powers of authors and the rights and powers uh, the, or the rights of individuals to get access to knowledge. And we made this trade off and we built on top of that over centuries to get to the point where we had a more and more restrictive, more and more complex and uh, uh, weighted towards the powerful uh, in copyright law. I believe the digital revolution is as equally unique as the age of the printing press was. We now live in a world where sharing ideas digitally can happen in ways that we would never have imagined during the age of the printing press. I think that's generally considered an obvious fact now. Something is happening in the digital age that has never happened before in human history. I think one of the mistakes we make, however, in looking at that revolution is we're still in the middle of it. If you look at the history of the printing press, it took 50 to 100 years before there was really understanding about what was happening to society because of this new technology. And I think if, even if we go back as far as, say, the 1940s with the invention of the transistor, we're still not even 100 years into this digital revolution. So we don't know yet how it's going to impact society in a really complete way. What we do know is while the digital revolution was beginning, the final monoculture of monopoly in the age of the printing press was coming to its greatest fruition. In 1983, this guy named Ben Bedikian wrote this book uh, called The Media Monopoly, where he talked about sort of a doomsday scenario of all these media companies merging with each other such that we had all, from print to television to radio to any type of media that was being given to people, at least in the US, it was under the control of a very few number of companies. And I read a quote this morning from uh, Ben Bedikian, who died just uh, about five years ago. He updated this book every five to 10 years for the rest of his life after 1983. And every time he said people, people would review it and say he was being too, uh, basically, uh, too pessimistic and what couldn't be right in his predictions that things were going to get worse. And by the time he published the last edition before his death, it was down to five companies that controlled all of the media in the world. And these companies don't just control print and music and television and movies. They also, many of them, control software and control the means by which you get software and the means by which you get the media on that software. So we had already started to create this. The copyright system had allowed the power in who controls how you get works of authorship and how you read them and what you're allowed to do with them. It, the power had been consolidated already by the time the digital revolution began. Now, most people consume media through software. Most of the way that you interact with knowledge in society is by using a piece of software to do it. So we have this weird situation where the software is ostensibly part of the wealth of human knowledge and the thing that the sort of the non-meta stuff that you want to look at is being delivered to you by that same software. So you sort of twice don't have certain rights to copy and share the stuff. So the, from my point of view, the lines between software and content are blurring. I think the lines between free software and free culture are, are, are blurring because the same issues come up in the digital world about what rights you ought to have when you get some digital artifact, some set of bits that you want to examine or learn from. Everything is delivered digitally, so if we didn't have a hierarchical control system that demanded you look and consider certain types of uh, rights and privileges based on the license, it would be easily to copy, share, and so forth. Digital data, absent DRM, is easy to copy and share and give to other people and so forth. Now, the interesting thing was the copyright system predated the digital age. It had already become incredibly restrictive, incredibly controlling on what you were allowed to do with works that were considered governed by copyright before we even had software. So, Software was born into a world that was already this kind of control, power control, control structure regime. 
And it was an entrenched system before we even had software. I still, to this day, think it's an undefeatable system. I, uh, people talk about copyright reform, and they talk about trying to convince um, the governments of the world and in their, their trade agreements to be less restrictive. I think that's probably hundreds of years away. So in the meantime, we invented an alternative system. Well, we didn't do it. It was actually one person. And I've been giving talks about free software for years, and every time I give a talk, I say, well, I really shouldn't put a picture of Stallman on my slides again, because I've done it hundreds of times. But there was an innovation that he came up with. He had a genius idea, which was to think about the issue of what rights people ought to have with regard to software, and came to the conclusion as a philosophical matter, basically, that control of source code was going to be essential to a free society, because software was going to slowly become more essential to the future of how we operate in a technological world. And for all the things RMS has done, both good and bad, I think the thing that he'll be remembered in the history books for is coming up with a workaround to this entrenched system that predated software to attempt to defend the freedom of software or somehow make it possible for us to operate in an alternative world of sharing software. And that idea, of course, is copyleft. Now, one of the interesting things I like to point out about copyleft is that it's primarily a strategy. It's not a principle unto itself, and I think many people make the mistake of thinking copyleft is some sort of philosophical principle onto itself. It really isn't. It's a, an attempt to work around a problematic system, namely copyright law, by using the power of copyright law against itself. If there is a real first principle uh, that we want to consider as part of what we in the free software world tend to do, the principle that users should have these inalienable rights to copy, share, modify, and redistribute software, I think that's a first principle. Now, it's difficult for me to kind of prove that epistemologically. I'm not a philosopher, so it's, I can't prove that as, a, as some sort of uh, true uh, a priori human right to you. I believe it's true. Uh, and as I said before, I think it intersects with many other rights that people ought to have in a digital age. But copyleft, for its part, is just a strategy. It's just a mechanism of licensing to try and work around the system. So the whole idea that licensing is something we pay attention to, which is admittedly from my generation of software freedom activists kind of an obsession, it's really because we were for this in, uh, historical system of copyright was forced upon us before software even existed. So we got obsessed with how do we work around that system because it's there in front of us. I used to be fond of saying that, well, copyleft is somehow this constitution. It's like a you know, constitutional democracy of your community, of your software project. I, I think that was a mistake. I think that's overstating the value of copyleft and how import, important it is. What copyleft really is, is it's this legal regime. It's a set of rules designed to mold behavior of people and how they treat each other in software. And as a legal regime, as a set of laws, you could think of it that way, it has all the problems you have when you have laws. Well. How do we enforce them? Do we hire a police force? What if the police force is brutal and we have to deal with its corruption? Who's allowed to be the police force? How do they operate? And even if we have a police force out there enforcing these laws, what if there are loopholes in the system that people just work around the whole thing? I think what has been really central to my work is considering those questions there. I don't think anybody was really considering these questions when they formed copyleft. I think one of the mistakes that my colleague RMS has made was this idea that somehow the copyright system was so powerful unto itself, which it is a pretty powerful and kind of dangerous system, that that power would somehow flow very easily into copyleft. I don't think it actually has because there were other power structures of large companies, namely their 
huge financial resources that were able to utilize the legal system of copyright to their own ends that didn't exist for free software authors. That's just one of the many places where I think we underestimated the ability of communities to use a licensing structure to stand up for free society and, and for free software. So it leaves me with the question, does this strategy of copyleft work at all? I've been asking myself this question basically on a daily basis for the last five years because I'm not sure if copyleft's working. And if copyleft's working, why do we have all this licensing stuff anyway? People don't like talking about licensing. I'm surprised I have a room full of people that are actually listening to me talk about it because people find it annoying, pedantic. They feel that it gets in the way. So when I think about my original goal, which was to create a, you know, to be part of creating a free society uh, for everyone and focusing on my little corner of software, in doing that, Am I totally on the wrong path by worrying about copyleft and worrying about the licensing of the software? Maybe I am. I, I, if, if I'm going to be you know, a, a, you know, an introspective thinker, I have to consider that question. And indeed, around 2012, there was kind of a meme in the community, uh, people who develop open source and free software, about this question, which got this name POS, or post-open source. This idea that licensing was just getting in the way. And now we have GitHub, so all you got to do is post your code on GitHub and everything's going to be all right. Everyone's going to have all the freedoms and rights they ought to have just because we have GitHub. It was, I, I'm oversimplifying the argument, uh, but not by much. Uh, but I, rather than dismissing it as ill-informed and naive, I actually tried to take it really seriously. M maybe, maybe we are screwing up by obsessing about licensing and strategies to use copyright to defend this freedom that we want, and is it even working, and maybe we should just be ignoring all of it. So I, I gave this serious thought. I didn't just dismiss it out of hand. And as I thought about it more, it reminded me of my early days. I'm, I'm fond of saying I dabbled in anarchy when I was a student, right? I, I, I was compelled by the idea of collectivism and, and you know, a consensus-based anarchy where everybody just sort of cooperates and you don't need a government. Um, I, I abandoned that idea as I got older because what I discovered was it's kind of this, it all just works out if everybody just acts in reasonable ways and tries to take care of each other, right? That's sort of the, the motivation behind anarchy. I think there's a tremendous amount of privilege in that. Uh, assumption that you go forward and say, well, everything's just going to be okay because we're, you know, we're such a great society. Well, if you're in a society where there's lots of equity and uh, uh, you know, between people and everybody's well fed and all that sort of thing, may maybe that could work. Uh, but in a society like we have now, where there's tremendous inequities around the world, we can't just assume it's all going to work out if we don't have any rules and we all just try to do the right thing. It, we've actually seen that it doesn't. We actually have hundreds of years of human history that show when people get into power, they become corrupt and they oppress pe other people. And we've been doing that as humans for centuries at this point. And I don't see how we can get around that without having rules in the equation, without saying there are rules and there is a body that's trying to uphold those rules and we have checks and balances on that body to make sure that it's not corrupt. So I come back to the conclusion that we do need something if we're going to try and make a world with software freedom, which would hopefully help us in the step towards a free society, at least in the world of software, we're going to have to have some sort of rules. So you come back to the conclusion, in my mind, well, okay, then the, 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 those rules are copyleft. What else do we have? Well, I, I'm, I'm ske more skeptical than ever about copyleft. Uh, it's not that I want to abandon it, uh, to abuse this quote. It's absolutely the worst way to solve this problem, except for every other solution anybody's ever thought of to solve this problem. I can't think of a better one, so we're still sort of stuck with this solution. And if I leave you with anything today, it's to tell you that the problem of how do we make software free, as in freedom, has not been solved. Go away and go think about that in your spare time, because someone sometime is going to have to come with a, up with a better idea of how we do it, because the ideas we have, while they're not totally hopeless, they have some serious flaws and bugs that we haven't figured out how to solve yet. So don't assume that that 
idea of how we keep software free has been solved. Even if you're not a fan of copyleft, it hasn't been solved. So especially if you're not a fan of copyleft, go start thinking of other things. Because even me, the guy who's probably the strongest copyleft advocate in the world, is telling you it's got some problems and may not work long term. So I don't really blame but, uh, the people who have been saying licenses are old hat. What, what is with all you old gray beards saying licenses matter so much? Um, I think that attitude is a symptom of a larger cultural problem that's occurred in the world of software in, in recent years. What I think has happened is effectively free software became popular a little too quickly. And as such, companies that came along to our community looked at what was happening in open source and said, there are mechanisms we can operate with them. There are loopholes we can find in this system that will allow us to exert control that those who were out there as the software freedom zealots didn't want us to have. And the reason these exist, one of the reasons these existed was, was that perhaps we were too fair uh, to the commercial side. Copyleft always had this idea that commercial and non-commercial activities should be 100% equal. And I'm for the idea of people generating revenue by using and producing and improving and modifying copylefted software. So I wouldn't want to see that go away. But because they were on equal footing, and because there is this power dynamic, namely that corporate for-profit entities are going to have a lot more resources than nonprofit ones, there's been a certain amount of for-profit exploitation of free software. And that is increasing, in my view, not decreasing. So I want to mention just a few problems. Each one of these that I'm raising here, I could give a whole hour talk on it. So I'm just going to give you a flavor of a couple of the problems that I've discovered uh, in this power dynamic that have been problematic over the last few years. One of them is the obsession, which was particularly bad in the mid-2000s. And I spent quite a bit of advocacy time trying to convince people to avoid these things. Uh, and had some limited success, but they're still very common. Namely, contributor license agreements. Now, the problem with these things is that they have a tendency to shift rights and control and power from individual developers and groups of individual developers to a single for-profit company. Usually, they're written in a way, if you want to contribute to our free software project, then you must sign this agreement that gives us control of the project, gives us control of the code that you wrote yourself, and we make more or less no promises back to you as a for-profit company, but you make lots of attestations and promises to us. So the advent of these systems, which of course plays into the whole post open source thing, because one of the places you can take, well, just put it all on GitHub is, well, actually, yeah, put it all on GitHub, but just click through yes to a bunch of agreements before you upload, which are probably some form of contributor licensing agreement, and don't notice the fact that you've just shifted all sorts of rights and powers under copyright and other legal regimes from individual developers to a for-profit company. Now, when you interact this with copyleft licensing, it completely nullifies the equity effect of copyleft. The value, in my view, in copyleft is that everybody is bound to everybody else by its rules. So if everybody in this room contributes some code to a copylefted project, every single person has obligations to every other person as far as making sure the source code's available and so forth. So if one of us makes a bunch of money doing stuff with that copylefted software, we still don't get to make it into proprietary software. We still have to give all the improvements and changes back to the rest of the community. If there's a single entity which is collecting all the rights, they're not bound by copyleft, even though all of you are. And that's the bug that is seen from this uh, perspective. The other problem, and the one that I've probably devoted the plurality of my career to, is the widespread violation of copyleft. I think. Even I had this impression that if we licensed our software this way, we, we designed a licensing solution to build a free society, that it would just work automagically. 
that the legal system, this horrible, powerful copyright regime, would just come to our aid because we'd reversed it with copyleft. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you go out and buy one of these, or you go out and buy one of these, or you go out and buy one of these, or one of these at this point, almost all of them are going to be running Linux, and almost none of them will actually give you the source code for Linux, or the changes they made to get it to work on that device, or the device drivers that are specific to that device, because almost all of them, almost the entire embedded software market, violates the GPL on Linux. So if we're going to live in a world where copylefted software is incredibly popular in every device, but none of it actually complies with the copyleft license, have we actually gotten anywhere with this licensing strategy? We don't have a world, at least in the embedded space, that looks all that different than what happens when you just put your source code on GitHub and ignore the license, because widely these large companies are, in fact, ignoring the license. So again, I sort of look at the post open source advocates and say, well, you kind of have a point. If copyleft isn't working, why are we spending so much time trying to make it work in this kind of desperate way that, that we're left trying to do? So another problem, I can give, you know, I, there's talks online if you want to hear more about GPL enforcement. That, that's just the flavor of it. You can, you can find dozens of talks of mine where I've talked about that. Another thing we've seen is kind of a corrupt use of copyleft that's become pretty common, uh, it w it, which happens in two ways. One is actually a little bit overblown, which is people who hold copyrights in existing multi-copyright held copylefted works like Linux and go out and try to monetize those copyrights. You'll see a lot of complaints about that particular concern. I'm actually much less concerned about that. I think it's going on and I think it's a problem, but I don't think it's a widespread problem that it's being pumped up in the press as. But the other type of monetization that we see is kind of an interaction with that contributor license agreement where companies have ostensibly licensed the work, uh, you know, some code base out there under a copyleft license, but almost no one's using it under that copyleft license because they've collected all the contributor license agreements from all the contributors, and most of their customers are running a proprietary fork of that particular project. So again, it's taking this licensing regime and finding a way around it, finding a way to utilize it to build basically the traditional power structures that we had in software before the advent of free software licensing at all. Finally, we're now seeing, and this is a much more recent problem, institutions that had historically been there to defend free software have begun to become corrupt. And I think there's a need for some constant vigilance on the part of the community to begin to look at the historical organizations that are out there. And I'm not going to stand and name names, but there are some that have become corrupt or were corrupt kind of from their formation and now this beginning to show those cracks. That's not to say that I'm up here saying, well, I work for the Software Freedom Conservancy and we're never corrupt. In fact, I'd love for people to watch us too. I, I believe in who watches the watchers. Somebody should be. And I think we have to be on the lookout for corruption in our community because it's becoming more common, mainly because there's more money floating around the community and money often equates to power and power often corrupts. Now, these are a bunch of detailed things that I tend to work on in my daily work. I, I don't think the details matter all that much. I think they're interesting mainly because those are the things I work on. Uh, but I want to focus now on sort of kind of the two overarching themes that I think come out from those kinds of problems we see in the licensing infrastructure of, of free software. I think really the root cause of all of these problems is the simple fact that free software kind of became too popular too early. We've now gotten to the point where even before we were able to fully develop our ideas, I talked about how it took decades and decades for us to understand the implications of the age of the printing press, even 100 years. Well, just within five to 10 years, actually really five years of even the idea that we should do something like an alternative to proprietary software, Free software packages, GCC is a great example, became 
an integral part of the for-profit industry. And I think the early adopters saw the value in copyleft. I'm thinking of something like Cygnus, who really saw the value in being part of the GCC community and operating under copyleft. But those who came after them didn't necessarily see the value in that. They saw the value more generally in the open source development model, but didn't really s subscribe to the idea of a just society where everyone's on equal footing with regard to software. And when I think about this, I, I realize it was actually much easier to be a software freedom activist when it was an incredibly radical idea that people didn't want to accept. Because anybody who was willing to develop free software was doing it primarily because they were motivated by this idea of building a just society. And therefore, they were much more resistant and resilient to the temptation of doing something different. With the popularity of free software, well, there's so many jobs that will let you work some time on free software. You know, 20% of your time, 30% of your time, you can contribute upstream. But what are you doing with the other 70 to 80% of your time? Well, you're mostly writing proprietary software. And even when you're working on the free software, companies have gotten incredibly adept at distracting developers, and I think generally developers are very easily distracted, <laughs> uh, with interesting technical problems such that they're not necessarily working on some of the most necessary parts of the stack that need to be liberated. And we have a world now where there's more free software written every day than ever has been written in history, yet it's become harder and harder to get through a day's work for the average user without using some proprietary software. It's really a paradox. More and more free software code, less and less ability to operate without any proprietary software. And I think the reason is, is this distraction issue. Developers are being distracted to focus on just small subsets of free software infrastructure. There's been kind of a detente where companies have decided, OK, well, these parts of our stack, these parts of the software stack will be free and liberated, but these other parts will not. These other parts will be proprietary, and we're going to continue to compete in the usual way with proprietary solutions there, and particularly in user space. We kind of won the war on the operating system front, and then the operating system started to matter less and less. And now everything else, like apps on phones and so forth, matter, and most of those are proprietary. I think developers are generally distracted and befuddled by their companies to work on the wrong things. And I, I say wrong things, I realize that's somewhat, um, uh, that's somewhat arrogant to say that, right? Because who am I to say what's right or wrong for somebody to work on? But I know many developers who think of themselves as software freedom activists who don't work on any of the top priorities, which they would agree are the top priorities for liberating users. They work on something different because that's what they're paid to work on. And they then get to the conclusion, well, I'm working on free software, so I'm doing the movement's work, the work of, of building a just and free society with software. But they've got the priorities mixed up by their employers. So that's kind of, I think, the first root cause. The second root cause has, has a lot to do with how software has changed. And again, because we're in this special period of when digital technology is just becoming part of our culture and part of our society, we're still seeing a certain amount of rapid change in how it works. And the biggest change that I think happened in the last basically 10 to 15 years is that the operating system and software stack that runs on your own device is not the only relevant thing as far as your freedom in the society. That device interacts with a network almost constantly, and things in the network also are affecting your software freedom, your individual rights to have control of your own computing technology. And of course, search was the first one of these. And I think people have been a little overly obsessed with, well, search is so hard to do, and therefore, is it that big of a deal that it's centralized with a company? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I think we should just ignore search for the moment because it has some weird effects that make it dif more difficult to analyze. I think an easier one to analyze is something like Google Maps. 
mapping data and having a GPS on your device and figuring out where you are on a map is such an essential part of many applications. And Uber is a great example, right? Uber exists as a business because they license Google Maps such that they can show you and the car that's coming to you on a map and show how quick it's going to get to you, then tell the driver where to go when they pick you up so they don't have to know how to get everywhere in the city. So th the whole idea of turn-by-turn -turn directions and all that stuff is an essential part of lots of our ecosystem. And it's all proprietary, although it's not, right? We actually have a tremendous amount of free software that does this. And we have an entire free data set that was built by community collaboration, totally in fitting with the pr principles of free culture and free, free software. Yet, there are very few applications out there based on this. The, majority of people who are doing things with mapping are using Google Maps or some other proprietary provider. So, so, and this stuff is all copylefted. The data set, I checked this morning to make sure I was right. The OpenStreetMap data set is under a data license that's a copyleft. The stuff that's just regular copyright, not data, is under CC by SA, which is a copyleft license. Much of the software that interacts with OpenStreetMaps is under a copyleft license. So we, we have so much work that's been done to try to solve that problem, yet it's being very underutilized. Why are so many people still using Google Maps anyway? Well, there's no drop-in replacements for lots of stuff that Google Maps does. I don't think you could go start a business, an Uber-like business, that just relied on OpenStreetMap. I don't think it would be anywhere near as featureful as the current Uber application that uses Google Maps. I just think that's probably certainly obvious. So why aren't we out there rushing to make it better? Well, one of them is the first problem I mentioned. Developers are focused on the wrong things. They're busy optimizing you know, file storage on Linux instead of writing the next great OpenStreetMap application. But there's more to it than that. I think that this licensing infrastructure we built has some serious flaw in it that's deterring people from doing what, say, Cygnus did with GCC. When Cygnus invested in GCC and said, we're going to start building a business around a copylefted thing, and we're going to release all of our code, a culture that lives on in the, the successor of Cygnus and Red Hat uh, to a great degree, it seems to me that those who are willing to engage in commerce around copylefted code bases and data sets must be skeptical about whether it will defend them. I, I don't. I haven't done a poll, I don't know that for sure, but given that copyleft is not really succeeding and given that copyleft violations are so common, I would suspect that if someone were going to go to the level of saying, well, you know what, maybe I should build my business around OpenStreetMap and oh, it's not good enough, I could contribute to its data set, I can contribute to the code bases around OpenStreetMap to do more stuff with mapping. I would expect that they probably see it as a safer business bet to just license whatever Google charges for you once you, I think Google charges once you have a certain number of, uh, number of hits against their API. They'd much rather pay that than take the risk of investing in a commons infrastructure that then may be exploited by a competitor. I would expect that they must ha go through that analysis if they even consider it at all. So you have to ask the question, maybe copyleft failed completely. I don't think that's right. I don't think we can make that conclusion yet. I think we're too early in the history of software freedom to decide whether this strategy isn't working or not. Um, so I don't want to just stand up here and say, Co copyleft failed, let's find something else. I think we should keep looking for something else because there are some bugs there that I don't know how to fix yet. But what I think we're seeing is that the legal infrastructure we have is ill-equipped to handle the power dynamic that exists in the world. I think our assumption was that the system would be there for us and we would have equal access to the kind of power that, say, the MPAA has when they enforce copyrights. But we didn't consider that it wasn't just the legal system, there was financial resources behind it uh, that these powerful companies that utilize copyright have that we in the free software licensing world don't. So that's a pretty pessimistic conclusion, I suppose. <laughs>
Um, I thank you. I am a pessimistic person by nature, but I'd like to end on somewhat of an optimistic note. While I think we're in an under-resourced area, and that's a central part of the problem because the power dynamic is wrong, because the people who oppose us have tons and tons of money, they also seem incredibly obsessed with those of us that are software freedom zealots. I am amazed the level to which companies spend time talking about me and trying to figure out ways to discredit me. I mean, I'm just some crazy guy who gives talks at conferences. Like, and the amount of back channel that I hear of obsession with trying to quell and squelch the ideas that we're expressing about software freedom, which are the same ideas that Stallman more or less was expressing 20 years ago that don't seem that radical to me anymore, uh, but apparently still seem radical. We're bothering somebody, and we're bothering somebody who's powerful. And from my point of view, that's good news, because if they weren't bothered, I'd be much more worried, right? Because then they would say, well, you don't matter, right? They just ignore me. They just ignore the, the, the more radical element. They would have considered their co-option of free software done and complete. But they haven't co-opted it into a corporate uh, design strategy yet, because if they had, they would ignore the remains of the radical free software element in the world. I think our biggest enemy is ourselves. I think developers have become complacent. I think lots of people that I grew up with in the free software world have taken jobs at Google and Facebook and a dozen other companies that employ developers. And they kind of have this expectation to be paid really well and to be allowed kind of that gilded cage to work on some free software. But I would encourage those of you that are developers to consider how worth it it is to do that. And maybe we need to make certain demands from these companies if we're going to be giving so much of our time and talent to them. And one easy demand, and this is my only real recommendation of things I'm gonna ask for people who work in the technology industry, just start questioning the level of control that companies have over open source and free software projects. Projects less and less are run by groups of individual developers. I used to hear developers say, I'm a contributor to project FUBAR first and employee of company Y second. People say that less and less. So if we could go back to a culture and revitalize the culture of we question our companies about what they want to do with these code bases and question our companies about control of our work. By default, in most countries, if you work for a company, they get most of the control of the copyright. In the US, it's called work for hire. They get all of the copyrights. In most European countries, they get all the exploitative rights. And the moral rights, I have to say, sadly, are not very much to enforce copy left. So in most cases, your companies are getting control of your copyrights, which means if you want to use licensing as a strategy to defend free culture, free software, free society in general, it won't work because your company will be the one who gets to make the decisions about what the licensing is and even if they choose to GPL it, whether that GPL ever gets enforced, et cetera. There is no reason in my mind, given the amount of demand there is for developer talent in the for-profit world, that developers couldn't all band together and say, we're not giving our copyrights to companies anymore. We're going to license our copyrights under our, the, our free software license of choice to our companies, and they'll have to live by that license. If developers stood up and said that, I think companies would be forced to give it to them. People who understand technology and are able to improve it actually have the power in this situation. And somehow, we've been convinced that we aren't powerful. The free society that we want in a technological society is really ours as technological experts to decide. And for a variety of reasons, we're not doing that. And if I leave you with any message today, it's the idea that if you're a smart technologist, you have power that you don't realize, and I think you have an obligation to use that power to build a free and just society.
So I hope you'll try to do that as you go out there in the world. That's really all I have to say. I'm happy to take questions with any time I have left. Do I, do I have time left for questions? Okay. Well, I mean, we're over time, but 15, mi 15 minutes left? Okay. So I'm out of time, apparently. So, oh, okay. So, okay. Okay. So do I have time to take questions or, or no? I'm confused. Okay. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Do we have a mic for questions for the recording or something like that? Or should I repeat them? How, how does it work? I'm looking at the AV folks. I, I will repeat questions. Does anybody have any questions? Do you believe that any for-profit companies are doing copyleft in a good way? So the question is, do I believe any for-profit companies are doing copyleft in a good way? I, I, I mean, I point to Red Hat a lot. I, I don't think Red Hat is perfect by any means. And, and certainly, I've had situations with Red Hat that I haven't been happy with how they handled things. But the old culture of Cygnus um, still lives on in Red Hat. And there are a lot of developers inside Red Hat who um, demand that Red Hat behave in certain ways. That culture, I'm told, is starting to die inside Red Hat as it gets bigger. But generally speaking, I, I think to the extent to which Red Hat is a reasonably good actor, it's because of the developers inside it pushing it in certain directions. Um, I think newer developers who go to work for Red Hat don't have that sense of how much power they have. Uh, and that's probably why that culture is changing. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think any organization is perfect. Uh, I don't think the organization I work for is perfect either. Um, but if I have to pick one that I think is doing the best it can, I would probably say Red Hat is, um, although they've made many a mistake. Um, I, I don't think there are, uh, uh, but the, and the other example I want to make about Red Hat is, is Red Hat actually has made efforts when they've acquired other companies that had proprietary components. A great example is Ink Tank, uh, which is the creator of Ceph, which was free software. They had other ancillary software that was proprietary, which they then released as free software after the acquisition. That kind of culture is pretty impressive. Uh, we don't see anybody else doing that. Um, there are lots of companies that are friendly to free software on those certain vectors, right? You look at somebody like Google that's incredibly friendly to free software on the operating system level. Like they've fought Android vendors about device drivers. They've done good things there. But absolutely every Google app is proprietary software. Anytime advertising interacts with the software, the software is going to be proprietary at Google. So there are lots of cases like that where you have companies that are friendly only on the stack that they think they don't need to have as a differentiating factor. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to comment a little bit there on uh, another company, Digital Igali. Yeah, Ig Igali is a great. I, I, I was sort of assuming the question was about big companies. Uh, you, uh, the, yeah. 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 Yeah, agreed. So, so the, the, the question for the, for the recording is about uh, Agalia, which is actually kind of a, I, I, if I'm describing it wrong, let me know. It's kind of a, co a, co a collective uh, 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 consulting shop is really how I would describe it. So they do free software consulting work. Uh, and as far as I know, they do everything as free software. They're relatively small, uh, which is why I didn't jump to them as an example. But I actually, I'm glad you brought it up because I, my view of what free software business looked like, you know, when I first got involved in free software, I didn't just work for charities. I, I have since uh, basically 1999. But in the um, late 90s, I thought I was going to do consulting around free software. And my vision of what it looked like to be in a free software business was lots of small consultancies as opposed to big monolithic corporations. Um, I, I go back to the point about Ben Bigdikian, right? If, we ha if we've seen in the media world that allowing large conglomerates to have control of an entire industry is incredibly dangerous. I think the same problem's happening in software. I would love to see thousands of small software companies instead of a few large ones. And back to my points about Red Hat, I think the extent to which Red Hat's gotten not as good, it was as it grew. Um, I think big corporations have this kind of weird dynamic uh, historically that they become these monoliths of kind of amor amorality. Not immorality, but amorality. They don't really have a soul anymore, uh, and therefore they just kind of act in the corporate interest and end up often doing bad things. But I think Igali is a great example of a company that's 
designed itself to be small, agile, and therefore have a real sense of morality as part of the company. Mm -hmm. consultants. So people will get hired there after a couple of years to become partners. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. I mean I think I think that's that's an important aspect. So he's talking about how in Egalia, after you work there a few years, you become kind of a partner. That, that's about equity, right? And that's and that's an intersect intersectionality issue. This idea that you should get a job and then you have some corporate overlord is problematic and it creates inequities and imbalances in society, and that's a way to mitigate that. So I'm a big fan of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.